So welcome to another video where we're going to talk about home lab stuff. So in this video, we're going to talk in particular about if you're building a home lab, some things you should think about in terms of power. So home labs use power. And so we'll talk about a few things you might want to think about when you're designing your home lab. So this little picture you see here is uh, when I was building my house, my home lab is sort of in between these walls here uh, and it's in concrete. And so it did require me to think a little bit about what was going to be there because a lot of it had to be done in conduit that was inside of poured concrete. And so it's a little hard to correct if you get it wrong. And so I did think a little bit about how I was gonna get power into the room and where it was gonna come from since it had to be done before the uh, concrete was poured. But we're gonna start with uh, the first topic on power is of course, you're probably gonna wanna have a UPS. And many people who have a UPS in their rack are gonna have a UPS located at the bottom of the rack. And it's gonna be, um, could be a small one, could be one, kilowatt or three kilowatt UPS, and you're going to plug the servers into the back of that. So the UPS is both a UPS and sort of a power strip. Uh, and you're going to plug this into the wall and then everything on that rack off the UPS is protected by the UPS. And so that's probably the most common use case you're going to see um, for UPS. But if you're going to buy UPS to use for your home lab, there are a couple things you should consider. So one is sort of the topology of the UPS, how it works. And there are really three major topologies. Um, the first topology is sort of this, what's called the offline UPS, which is where the power coming in goes straight through to the output. And so your computer is over here. They are running off the power coming in. Uh, it also taps into that power to charge the battery. And if the power fails, then this inverter will turn on and start providing power to the loads you have here. Um, and this is a pretty typical, relatively inexpensive way of doing a UPS. Um, it's usually pretty fast. This switchover can be a you know, few, few milliseconds, sometimes even 10 milliseconds. But that's fast enough that most of the power supplies in your servers won't even notice the drop at all. Um, this is a, a reliable way to build something. Um, it has one downside, which is that in this design, you're not using the inverter at all when you're just sitting here. So you might turn the UPS on and your power is working great and it runs for two years and little did you know that the inverter has a problem in it and it, you won't know it until all of a sudden the ac power cuts the inverter kicks on starts trying to drive these loads and then the inverter fails and so now everything's down uh, obviously you can help prevent that a little bit by testing this occasionally and so if you put a ups in your rack i really recommend that you once every quarter, maybe, maybe once every six months, go in there with a stopwatch, unplug the UPS, start your stopwatch and see how long it runs. Maybe let it run from 100% down to 10% or 20%. Um, and keep a track of how long it runs versus how long it thought it was going to run. Really common thing in UPSs is, is that you walk up to it and it says, hey, I can run for 12 minutes at the current load. Power fails. A minute later, it says, you got 30 seconds left. That happens all the time because it doesn't really know how long the batteries were gonna last. It doesn't really know the condition of the batteries that well. So do a test occasionally where you pull the power to the UPS and see how long it runs. That has the advantage that it's gonna exercise both the batteries and the inverter um, and sort of the whole system and see if it's gonna work. But in any case, so this offline UPS, it's a very common way to do it. Um, it's relatively efficient. The power going through in most use cases goes straight through almost like this is a power strip. So it's a really, easy way to hook up a UPS and have it work. So a second topology is what's called line interactive. Um, and it's a minor difference. The biggest difference is that you generally have some type of work being done here on the AC input. And mostly that's filtering. The model is still very similar. The inverter itself isn't necessarily what's powering the equipment. The power goes straight through. And if the power gets cut, the inverter turns on. So you have the same problem here where the inverter has to work when you need it. But it has the advantage that the power interface usually does some suppression of noise. So harmonic distortion in the incoming 60 Hertz waveform, uh, as well as suppresses some voltage spikes um, and provides some general regulation. Now, if this power is a little bit low coming in, it's not necessarily gonna fix that, but it can do some filtering and suppression. So this is sort of an improvement over the uh, offline UPS. But the really neatest way to do UPS is what's called an online double conversion. And sometimes it's called inline double conversion um, or double inline conversion. And the idea is that the power coming in gets converted to DC. 
and then goes to the battery and keeps the batteries charged, but also goes to the inverter and then the inverter generates AC. And in this mode, you're running the AC output. So what your computer sees is AC that was generated by the inverter. So it's made in the UPS all the time. So you, the AC waveform is being generated by the UPS based on the power coming in, but there's a decoupling between the actual AC power coming in and the AC power going out. And the big advantage of that is that the inverter is going to generate a, a very clean, low harmonic distortion, precisely 240 volts, 60 hertz AC output, regardless of what the input voltage is, regardless of the input frequency, and regardless of the input noise. So it really is taking the AC and regenerating the AC for the devices to use. And so as a result, these um, online conversion UPSs produce really, really clean power. And if you're in an environment where the AC input power could potentially be either dirty or have dropouts or overshoots, then this provides a really clean output power to your devices. Now, there's obviously a downside to this, which is that you're running through the rectifier and the inverter all the time. And this whole system is, you know, it may be maybe 90% efficient, 95% efficient at, at higher loads. They get a little more efficient at high loads, but you are burning five to 10% of your total power inside of this rectification and then the inverter. Um, and keep in mind that any power you put in that doesn't come out is leaving this as heat. So, you know, if it's a five kilowatt box, you may have 250 or 500 watts of power that's gonna be converted to heat inside the UPS. And so depending on where your UPS is located, that um, may be an issue. Uh, but, you know, a, a great question is, you know, is it really necessary? And, you know, it depends on the quality of your AC power. Um, I think I do have a graph here. I can switch over to a graph. So this is from uh, my IOTA watts, which they monitor all of my house power. So they monitor every circuit. And this is monitoring one of the two 120 volt legs coming in. And this was back in January. Uh, and you can see it's humming along at 120 volts. You know, you see a few little dips here, but then whammo. I mean, this is down to like 80 volts, 81 volts there. And you see a couple more of these dips and couple more and then this line here is actually because it lost data because it lost power so this is like a tree or a branch impacting one of the power lines probably arcing against it and it's arcing and faulting and sometimes it'll arc and just clear the branch out by burning it up and you can see it's happening a few times and then eventually it fails entirely and we lose power and occasionally you'll see it that this will happen that you'll lose power for just 30 or 40 seconds and a rebreaker will return power back on again. And sometimes that will clear what's touching the line, but not always. So in cases like this though, if you didn't have an online conversion UPS, these voltage drops would almost certainly make it through. Even with the line interactive, um, you'd probably see some of these voltage drops. Is that a problem? It depends a little bit on your equipment. Some equipment is more sensitive than others to voltage drops. So it's something to be aware of that it, it, it may cause a problem depending on the sensitivity of the equipment you have, but the online conversion models do really take care of that drop. And these do really happen. If I look at over a period of a year, there'll be at least three or four conditions where uh, the voltage is dropped by down to 70 or 80 volts because of something hitting a line. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, so with that in mind, so, you know, if you can afford to get the um, double online conversion, I would, it's a great UPS strategy to use. Um, but even if you can't, having a UPS itself that you test regularly is a great addition to your home lab. Um, so a different consideration is, is where you're going to put it at. I think in most cases, you're going to see, you know, they're going to be at the bottom of a rack and your servers are on top of it. That's very, very, very common. So it, it works fine and there's nothing really wrong with that. If you have the possibility to put the UPS in a different location, I would definitely consider it. And the only reason is that of everything you have in your home lab, the UPS is probably the biggest fire risk of anything you have. Generally, servers don't catch fire very often. They can, but it's a pretty low probability. Um, the UPSs are not some tremendously high risk. They're UL rated devices. Um, if there was a tremendous risk of them, you'd hear about a lot of fires from them. But there have been some fires. If you talk to someone who works on UPSs a lot, most of them will have seen at least one either fire or smoke producing event. So if you can have the UPS in a different room that has a little better protection, it has the advantage that a fire there wouldn't affect your computers. Um, 
In fact, let's go take a quick look at how my UPS is hooked up because that's a good demonstration of how you can separate the two. All right, let's go take a look at this UPS. So this is the UPS that powers my home lab and it's in a room that is a mechanical room. So it's sort of dedicated for, there's a furnace and a water heater uh, and then the main power feed coming in for the UPS and the power going back out. And so in this case, it's sort of a dedicated room for this purpose. This room also has a fire suppression system. So there's sprinklers and you can see the sprinkler, uh, incoming sprinkler controls, which is actually for sprinklers for the entire house. But there's also a set in here. Uh, and there's also a fire detection system in here that will detect fire and set off the fire alarm and call the fire department. Um, and the only thing I haven't done yet, which I should do is I should add like an EPO right here. Uh, an emergency power off button that would cut the power to this room. You can cut the power from upstairs, um, but if you're coming down here in a fire, you wouldn't want to have to go back upstairs. So it'd be good to add that as an additional safety measure. So the power that comes out of this UPS then comes out in the server room. And we'll walk over here. And so you can see the power out there on the wall. Um, and so there's two circuits, those are each 30 amp, 240 volt, those are 1430 plugs, which means they have both 240 uh, and 120, but all the servers are all uh, 240 volts. So these PDUs are running at 240 volts, and so all the power supplies uh, end up running at 240 volts, which is a lot more efficient. And so that's how it works. Okay, so, and I just took a quick look to see if I can find an example of what happens when a UPS catches fire. So these are mostly battery fires. That one's some capacitors. Uh, occasionally you'll have a UPS that will overcharge or undercharge a battery and overcharging can make them explode like that, which is not a good thing. Uh, and sometimes you'll get things like this. Um, these are pretty big UPSs, so you're not going to see this as much on a small UPS, but it is, it is a UPS is storing a lot of power in a small amount of space in a chemical form. So, um, it is certainly possible that you can get, uh, a problem in your UPS that causes a fire. So with that in mind, there's a sort of a second minor thing to consider when you're doing your power for your home lab, and that is running everything at 240 volts. So for those of you in other parts of the world other than the US, you're probably wondering what I'm talking about. So in the US, power coming into the house is typically brought in at 240 volts, along with a neutral that provides 220 volt, commonly used called legs. And the 240 volt is generally connected to things like dryers and air conditioners. And most household plugs and walls are 120 volt. And so most servers in the US, most computers can plug in to 120 volts, but almost all of them can run at 240 volts. I have not a single computer in my entire server room that can't run at 200, 240 volts. Even you can't see, it, but there's some old servers here, like some SunSpark stations, even those can run at 240 volts. So. If you can do it, if you can bring 240 volts into the room that you're gonna do for your home lab, you should do it. It isn't super hard to do. It doesn't require anything magical. Uh, you can sometimes do it with the same wire. Sometimes you have to add an extra wire if you want 240 and 120 both. Um, but it has a huge gain in efficiency, both the UPS and the power supply in all of the computers, all running at 240 volts is more efficient. And so, just fundamentally costs you less money to run your lab at 240 than at 120. You get better efficiency, less heat, less line loss through all the wires in your house. So if you can buy a UPS that can do 240 and you can bring 240 into the room um, and then run all the computers off 240. Um, and you can bring in both 240 and you can bring in a neutral to give you 120 just in case you have some devices that need 120, um, which there are a few, but not very many, but it's a great piece of advice if you're building a lab to make it more efficient. And so I think if you have a good UPS setup and you have 240 volts, you can have a pretty efficient lab. Um, and of course, the next big question is, if you have this power coming into the room, how do you cool it? And so for the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about cooling the home lab.